Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and this is a Trinitite sample. In July uh, 16th, 1945, an atomic bomb was detonated at the Trinity test site near uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico, and it was a plutonium device, 20 kiloton yield, so that would be like 20,000 tons of TNT going off, kind of a big boom. And a lot of the sand that was around it was actually melted and turning, turned into glass. This is a piece of it. While nowadays, of course, it's illegal to take trinitite from samples from the actual site, back in the 40s and 50s and such, before it became that way, when it was, quite frankly, not open to the public, but people could get in there pretty easily, uh, huge amounts of these samples were taken. They were made into jewelry and all kinds of other terrible ideas. So there's plenty of it floating around uh, with collectors that's perfectly legit, like this little guy right here. Um, but I guess it is kind of a um, limited resource. There's only a certain amount of it there that you can get, and you can't get any more, so there you go. Although you can go to Trinity if you want to look and see what's there. You just can't take anything. But this little guy is quite impressive. So let, let's put this under the microscope. Let's put this under the gamma spectrometer. Let's uh, put this under the high-resolution um, macro zoom lens. And let's see what kinds of things we get off of it. Trinitite. All right, now I have this sample under a macro zoom lens, so you can see it kind of up close and personal. I have this little tool here, it's a screwdriver obviously, for pointing things out. Now right off the bat you might notice the green coloration. It has that nice, famous trinitite green coloration. And you can see the little bubbles. Oh wow, they're, I don't know about you if you can see them or not, but they're extremely obvious. Like here's the humongous one right in the middle. And there's lots of little ones. If we rotate this guy around a little bit, it's kind of, Rotate the whole stand here so it catches the light nicely. You'll see, let me see if I can bring it into focus a little better. Focus on this lens is extremely narrow there. And of course, the first thing I do is whack it with my hand. Look right here. See this area? Look at those little tiny, I don't know if you can see it or not, look at the little tiny bubbles, there's bazillions of them. Yeah, we can tell you one thing for sure, and that's that this guy right here was formed in something very hot and very quick. And I know one thing that satisfies that criteria. But anyway, weirdly enough, obviously I'm wearing gloves. As you can see on the other side, this right here is the actual most radioactive side. And like I said, it's not very radioactive. I'll show you that, but look closely. My assumption is that dirt kicked up from the blast was deposited into the molten glass right here. That dirt may have been closer to the blast, which may explain why this part right here is hotter than the other side. I get almost nothing off the other side, but I get a little bit off of this side. So that's my guess as to what's causing this side to be more radioactive. This also doesn't look like the other side either, um, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. But if you look at it under the microscope, you see little fragments of things, which we'll do in just a minute, and you'll see what I mean. It looks like there's stuff buried inside of it. Of course, you'll also see lots of little bubbles and things. So, wow, an actual trinitite sample. To think that this little rock was not that far away from the first nuclear blast it is quite disturbing as well as interesting. But anyhow, let's look at this under the microscope and let's look at some higher resolution photos and see what we can see under the radiation detectors. Alright, we can see that we're getting around 180 to 220 counts per minute. It goes kind of back and forth and at first I was wondering if this was mostly alpha, but I blocked it with a sheet of paper without any problem, and I know that this thing isn't kicking out alphas any greater than maybe 5 MeV, so I know that that can't be uh, anything strange going on. Anyhow, um, I'm assuming that it's going to be mostly beta, and the reason I make this assumption is because my uh, gamma-sensitive probes, which I'll show you in just a second, barely read this thing and they have a way higher uh, likelihood of reading a gamma ray, a way higher efficiency, if you like, than this Geiger counter does. Geiger counters are not really that great at reading gamma rays overall. They're pretty good at betas, though. So this is probably betas coming off of this thing. So um, I have this lifted just above the detector using the scientific graded Tic Tac container. Yes, the obvious amazing science equipment right there. Uh, so you have a big wide pancake probe. And without the actual a uh, source nearby, this is going to drop down to, oh, about 30 counts per minute or so in just a minute. We'll stick it there and let it do that. 
Now, on a, on a Geiger counter like this, like an older Geiger counter, which is ironically, a, you might say, a period Geiger counter. It's from the right time period. Let's cut the volume up a little bit. You're not going to detect much of anything. Let's put this against the check source. See if we can, there we go, we can hear it. Okay, it has a speaker on the side so you can hear stuff. So there we are. We are in straight up counts per minute. So we're getting almost no counts per minute. You don't hear any ticks, do you? Just occasionally. We put this over top of it. We might get maybe a count or two. This is with the beta window open, in case you're curious. I'm getting nothing off of this guy. Now, it's not because it's not radioactive. It's just because this thing is not the hottest thing out there. Let me tell you, common residential smoke alarm will get these things going more than that will. But anyway, let's cut that off. Now, let's show you the gamma scintillation device. Now, this gamma scintillation device is a Ludlum Model 12 with a 44-2 1-inch uh, sodium iodide scintillator, in case you're curious. And uh, it's reading about, let's put it in slow mode. It's in the times 10 mode, so it's reading about 2,200 counts per minute, which is eh, a little low for my uh, background in my lab, but you know, whatever. Let's cut the sound on. That's what it sounds like, the background radiation in my lab. When I put it near the sample, without, I don't really want to touch it exactly, I'm touching the paper, not the sample. It doesn't appreciably go up at all. Maybe a couple hundred counts per minute at best. It's almost nothing. And and cut this off. If I were to connect a x-ray probe, my cables tangle all over the place. Oops, I'm going to bump my sample here. It's a problem with shooting videos. Normally you don't shoot videos when you're doing stuff, so it's like, you know, big grief. This right here is a tiny little 15 millimeter um, cesium iodide thallium dope scintillation probe. It's an x-ray probe. And we'll put it in the times one mode and see what we get and speed it up. Alright, so we're getting about 420 counts per minute. You might say the reading of 420 counts per minute is rather high for this background. But anyway, all fun aside, we put this nearby. Goes up a little. A couple counts per minute. Maybe, what is that, 60 counts per minute, which isn't much for this detector. And that's the radioactive side of this uh, rock, to say the least. All right, we went hard over, but not by much. So, I think we can safely say the hypothesis that this is putting alpha mostly beta is relatively confirmed. And considering what's in the gamma spectrum, I think it also makes sense. All right, so let's cut on the microscope. I have a fresh uh, new glove on. Technically speaking, you shouldn't really need a glove to hold a, a, a weak trinitite sample. They're usually regarded as safe, but like I'm never 100% sure of what people's definition of safe is, so I just wear the glove. It's no big deal to use. Uh, once I've touched the sample, I won't touch the scope with it anymore, but until I actually touch the sample, I might as well touch the scope all I want. I'll use this uh, slide. This is really for biology, so it's kind of odd to do rocks with it, but um, this little slide, I don't know if you can see it or not, it has a little tiny depression inside of it. Inside of this depression, I can put the sample. So let me kind of like put this down here and see if I can get the sample here. Now let's find a good place in the sample. So it looks nice. Yeah, that looks good. Now, oh Lord, let's see if I can lift this thing up. Um, yeah, picking it up, problem. Now, try not to wobble this thing out of my hand. It's like rocking all over the place. Let's get that stuck into there. And now, once we cut the lights on, we might begin to be able to see some things. But anyhow, oops, there we go, starting to see stuff. Let's look at some pictures under the microscope and see what it looks like at close up. All right, so let's zoom in here at 100 times magnification. 100 times. Oh, there we go. Let's see if we can adjust to move over. Adjust, adjust, adjust. No, no, wrong way. There we go. Now, I see those little circles in the middle of the screen. Those are bubbles created by massive amounts of heat. Like, look at the amount of heat that created those bubbles. Let's move up to 400 times magnification. Look at the bubbles. Okay, anybody have any questions as to whether this was formed in a high heat event? Yes, this sand was actually melted by the blast. Most of it was melted into a molten slag and the dirt fell on top of it and stuck to it as it rapidly cooled. 
and you can tell. I love the green color. By the way, the green color is not from like radiation or uranium or anything like that. It's actually naturally occurring in the rocks. It might be from europium. Europium is often green when it's in, under certain chemical scenarios. Uh, let's see here. It's all looking to be pretty uniform. Let's look for something else. All right. You can definitely see in this extra fine little region right here, little bubbles everywhere. Oh my god, look at them. Again, these are made by heat. It's kind of like the way bread works. Well, bread has yeast in it and gas. Well, it's similar, I guess. Those little yellow things are little specks of dust that got stuck inside of the molten material as it cooled, most likely. That's what I assume they are. Some of them are inside of bubbles. You can't see it very well in the, on the image right here, but believe it or not, some of them are inside of bubbles. I can see them. Um, yeah, I wish this were a little higher quality, but, you know, this isn't like a $10,000 medical microscope or anything like that. Look at that. Alrighty. Wow. Now let's take some photographs of these things at maybe a lower resolution and see what those look like with a macro zoom lens, of course. As you can see, this is the dirt that's fallen on top of the molten glass before it completely cooled. This side is the most radioactive side of the entire rock. It's the ugly side, but it's also kind of like the hot side. Anyhow, let's look at the green part. There's the green part. There's actually like the little glass. Look at the crystals it forms. I love using a macro zoom lens because it lets you get a nice and close and get a good view. A microscope's fine, but a macro zoom lens is really, really neat. So this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Oh, let's look at the god bubble, the big one. There it is. Boom, the humongous bubble. So uh, don't forget to subscribe and like hit the like button if you like it and everything like that. Um, I appreciate you coming and watching my videos. I have more coming, so bye-bye.